Democrats, today is Thursday, October 12th, and it's time for the Chair's Daily Live. Except for on Thursdays, it's the Chair and Representative Mickey Dollins. Happy Thursday. All righty, so we have a lot to cover. I'm not going to do a whole lot of preliminary. I'm just going to join Mickey Dollins, have Mickey Dollins join us right now. How's it going, Rep? Hey, Alicia, I'm doing well. How are you doing this week? You know, it's been a rough week, but we'll, we'll make through. It's almost over, right? I know. There's a lot going on. I hear you. So I think of you as a champion of addiction intervention. Is that accurate? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I would uh, proudly take that. It's a problem not just across Oklahoma, but especially in Oklahoma City and the district that I represent as well. So um, there was this, this news broke about a huge ketamine um, arrest that, that happened uh, in the last couple of days. And uh, the article was talking about how there's been an influx since uh, COVID in your job as a rep and what you do in your um, in your other work. Have you seen that? Yeah, outside of the Capitol, I've always had a job outside of the state legislature and the nonprofit sector has worked really well with accommodating my schedule at the Capitol. And right now I work for a nonprofit that focuses heavily on harm reduction measures. So we give out hundreds and hundreds of naloxones every single month, fentanyl test strips, ways for people to properly dispose of their medications. And unfortunately, it's just hitting Oklahomans really hard. And after having shared experiences talking to people who are either experiencing homelessness, mental health issues, addiction, they're in recovery, one of the things that they have a hard time getting is hope. Uh, and I feel like in many ways, the state legislature, the GOP supermajority has put up many obstacles and barriers that have made it more difficult for people to get back on the track to sobriety, to get back on the track toward finding hope and um, positive things in their life. For example, I was just talking to a gentleman a couple days ago who was on the corner uh, of an intersection near my house and he was telling me that his backpack was recently stolen and inside the backpack was his id but in order to get a new id he needed 25 dollars, and that's just something he didn't have you know he'd be lucky to get that over the week of asking for money on the street corner and he also was trying to eat as well so these challenges are compounded and i think that there's a lot that the state can do in helping mitigate a lot of those barriers and i was meeting with community leaders today actually um who have food pantries and who are offering transitional housing. And there's so much that the city, county, and local level and state level can do to help people with these issues. And I say all of that because drugs, unfortunately, uh, such as ketamine, offer an escape from the reality, which is often too harsh for people to want to confront. So they look for escapes to leave their reality and, and, and find some reprieve. And while, you know, you, you can't blame them, that's not a sustainable model because, as you know, there's so many people that end up dead, especially from fentanyl and ketamine and who knows what will be the next one. But, um, of course, drug dealers prey on vulnerable in individuals and whenever they get them addicted, then you see an increase in theft and other problems and crimes and abuse. And, and so it is a huge problem, but it starts with leadership and the state helping people get back on the road to sobriety and recovery. Because while you know we offer fentanyl test strips and naloxone, and it's not to condone drug use, but we know that someone has to be alive in order to rehabilitate them back to good health and back to productive members of society and back to ultimately where they wanna be as well. Okay, so before some Republican who's watching this grabs a hold of this and tries to make it into a border argument, Ketamine comes from China, mostly in Oklahoma, right? Yeah, that's correct. From all the research I've done and the stories that have been on the news lately, that seems to be the case. And as you know, we did put a moratorium 
on China from buying up huge swaths of land out in rural Oklahoma. Uh, and they were doing th so with the help of some GOP elected, um, well, not elected, but some bureaucrats within the GOP that were uh, filing for some grow licenses. And unfortunately, they were buying so much land in rural Oklahoma, they were raising the land value to where honest farmers couldn't expand their operations because the uh, market value had been driven up so much uh, artificially. And we did put in a moratorium on that. And, and there was a lot of illegal activities aside from just um, shipping a lot of marijuana across state lines. But uh, we saw a lot of evidence that was, um, you know, uh, non-excusable. And so we did put a moratorium on China from buying up more land in rural Oklahoma. But from everything I've looked at, the ketamine is primarily manufactured in China and it's being brought over here that way. It's not coming across the southern border. Um, from my understanding, uh, there's many different ways that it's getting over here. One way is in cargo ships and it's packed in uh, cardboard. I mean, there's insane ways that people try to hide illegal substances to get it in uh, into, into, the, into the United States. So when you were talking about folks who, who are dealing with addiction and, and um, you mentioned homelessness, I've been ranting and raving about how I believe that Oklahoma is in the middle of a crisis of homelessness and how our governor ended the commission on homelessness earlier um, in this year. And then I find out that the um, Oklahoma Housing Finance, I can't think what the A stands for, has now said, you know, we can't have anybody applying for Section 8 right now because we have too much of a backlog. It, it's so unfortunate and it's so tone deaf for the governor to cancel that commission and put it strictly on churches and nonprofits to solve this huge problem, especially when the GOP have prevented local municipalities from raising their own local minimum wage. Right now, rent in Oklahoma is skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. You have the vouchers from the federal government, thanks Joe Biden, that help 10,000 Oklahomans who are very low income earners with sex, Section 8 housing vouchers. There are currently 17,000 people on the list which is why the Oklahoma Housing Finance Authority have had to put a moratorium on giving out more Section 8 vouchers. But if you look at a voucher, that covers about $500. You know, for, for a person who's making minimum wage in Oklahoma right now, they'd have to work two full-time jobs in order to afford a one or two bedroom apartment. The math isn't mathing. We have a $500 stipend from a Section 8 voucher it's not going to cover the about average $1,200 for an apartment. And then all of a sudden, they're evicted and now they're homeless. And as you know, the majority of us in Oklahoma are just one or two paychecks away from being homeless ourselves. So it's not a uncommon issue to say, hey, this could happen to anyone with one bad medical bill, an accident, a laid off from, job, from your job. It could happen to any of us. And, and right now, this state is failing the most vulnerable. And these are people, mind you, who are working, but they cannot make, um, there are some people who are, you know, working minimum wage jobs and not able to make rent based off the exploitation of cheap labor. Well, there's exploitation of cheap labor, but um, I read a study earlier this week that says that Oklahoma City and Tulsa are in the top 20 of all metros in the nation in raising rents. <laughs> uh, it's, it's amazing. We often think of San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York City, Chicago as having high rents. But actually, this market right here in Oklahoma City is huge. The, the, rent, the, the rent is skyrocketing. And people in rural Oklahoma are leaving rural Oklahoma and coming to the city for opportunity because they see the effects that MAPS has had on our quality of life. And they want to be a part of that. Well, the housing supply is is not there. It's it's just not keeping up. And so with the lack of investment in rural Oklahoma, naturally you have people moving to the suburbs and to the metro, but there's not enough units to house people. And for those who are looking for a place to rent, it's astronomical. When I bought my house next to U.S. Grand High School in South Oklahoma City about 10 years ago, the majority of my neighbors were original homeowners when the homes were built in 1960s. They're about a thousand square foot. Uh, now I'm one of the only homeowners on my block. The others have either passed away, they've moved away, and now they are 
great neighbors, but they're paying rent and they're pretty transient, so they come and go. But one of my neighbors who I've become good friends with told me the other day what he's paying in rent, and it's about two and a half times more than what I pay in a 15-year fixed mortgage. So you combine that with low wages, high rent, and a really tough time. Um, it makes it really difficult to ever become a homeowner. And we know that owning a home is one of the best ways to uh, make generational change going forward when it comes to uh, finances. I will say that last year, the Oklahoma passed the Housing Stability Program. And the goal there is to encourage building affordable housing. And uh, we, as a state, are investing $215 million into that. And there is some down payment assistance for people who are looking to become homeowners. So that's a step in the right direction. We need to incentivize building homes like mine, the 900 to 1,000 square foot homes that uh, are, are, are not huge, but they are comfortable. And then also, um, you know, the... Uh, the city of Oklahoma City with the MAPS program passed, you know, the people of Oklahoma City chose to pass the $55 million to address the homelessness issue. And there's so many factors into that. I mentioned one of the people I was talking to um, had mentioned that their ID was stolen. And so that made it really difficult to withdraw the uh, little amount of money they had in their bank account or to do just basic functions. It's amazing how often we use our ID and, and we don't even think about it. Some people uh, who are on the streets or unhoused, their best companion, their best friends or their pets, and they can't go into temporary housing with their pets or they may lack a physical address to receive mail. I mean, these type of things are fixable through the legislature, uh, especially when it comes to mail and waiving, for example, the $25 uh, fee to get a replacement ID. Those are little things that the legislature can do to make that path toward stability less difficult. And that's where a, a big part of my focus is going to be going into this 2024 legislative session. Well, I'm glad to hear that because housing is a problem. And you, you spoke of folks moving from rural communities to Oklahoma City for the for opportunities, but also housing in housing in rural Oklahoma has also become more difficult because they don't have enough units even in rural Oklahoma, uh, affordable units in rural Oklahoma to be able to stay there because you know of of all the the things of all the um, economic indicators of what we're doing in rural Oklahoma. To mention, to hit on that real quick, there's some pretty innovative ideas that are coming along, like 3D printed homes. And also you can get around some city ordinances if you have a tiny home that's on wheels. And, and that wheel isn't specified as an actual like trailer wheel or a roller skate wheel. So keep that in mind. I just met with a um, preacher who's got a, uh, a church and um, they're looking at temporary housing and they've found out a way to create a comfortable 100 square foot temporary housing unit with a fire alarm, air conditioner, heat, electricity. Uh, they've built one of those for $800 and it fits within the space of a parking lot. Now imagine if every nonprofit and church in Oklahoma were able to accommodate two or three of these in their parking lot, that would go a long way, especially with how many churches we have in Oklahoma City. I can just count pretty much two or three on every block in my district. So that could be a huge uh, step in the right direction, but we have to address eventually some outdated zoning regulations when it comes to each municipality. The accessory dwelling units are a big thing that benefits homeowners and people looking for housing, but the uh, city ordinance have to come up with, have to come up to date and, and get into the modern, modern day when it comes to their zoning ordinances. So let me shift to something um, I don't know if I qualify this as good news or bad news. Let me shift to this. I've been getting inundated with emails and texts and messages, and I wonder if you've been getting them, with people saying that they're working with Texas or they're working with someone else to try to keep Donald Trump off of our ballot. Have you been getting any of those? No, but I would, I would expect I probably wouldn't be their target audience either. But <laughs> can you explain a little bit more? They want to keep Donald Trump off of the ballot. How so? They want to, you know, because of um, what's the one I got yesterday, because he doesn't qualify because of Article 14, blah, blah, blah. And so I wanted to take today 
Thursday when Mickey Dollins is here and viewership is up to say to everyone, if you're getting a text with someone who's raising money, if you're getting an email or a Facebook pop up with someone who's raising money to keep Donald Trump off of the ballot in Oklahoma. Don't <laughs> do not participate in that um, in Oklahoma. Um, the only person, the only entity that can keep someone off the ballot is another candidate. That's it. There's not some money that can be raised. There's not some organization that can make it happen. It has to be a, another presidential candidate who objects for cause for Donald Trump to be on our ballot. So unless something happens between now and December, he's going to be on our ballot. We all just have to know about it and we have to do the work to make sure that we don't vote for a twice in beach for impeached, four times indicted, um, beaten presidential candidate. That's a great point. There's always someone out there looking to make uh, a little bit of money off of people. And for all we know, that could be the Trump campaign with some reverse psychology uh, strategy to try to make money uh, and then flip it around and, I don't know, um, buy another jet. But yeah, I would, I would just be very careful and cautious anytime hey, more lawyers. someone wants you to donate money um, just make sure you are familiar with the organization and um, also that everything is on the up and up when it comes to legalities, which you perfectly pointed out. Right. And so just, you know, I want to repeat it again, because like I said, I've been getting inundated, which is weird, uh, but I've been getting inundated with uh, let's, you know, let's raise some money to keep Trump off the ballot. If they thought that it was a real thing, I'm not the person to come to because I would already be working on it. Um, but so. I don't want him on our ballot. It's going to make me mad next year to see his name on our ballot. But I also believe in our election process and I believe in doing, following everything the right way. And if we don't want him back at the White House, we all have to mobilize and mobilize our friends and family and make sure that we all vote. That's a great point. And voters can channel that energy into campaigning for candidates that they like for at the very least showing up to the polls, giving those who may need right assistance to the polls. Uh, you know, we just uh, had a great candidate get uh, nominated on the Democratic ticket down in Lawton, uh, Mr. Bush. And so he's going to be coming up on a very important special election against an extremist right winger who is wanting to essentially legislate their morality upon all Oklahomans, uh, which we've seen quite often with theocrats in the state legislature. And so if you want to mobilize and channel that energy into something constructive, I would uh, highly recommend getting on Mr. Bush's campaign team, going down a lot and knocking a few doors, as that's going to be a pivotal, uh, really important race that's coming up. And I believe that'll be, is that in December? Alicia? Yes, that's December, uh, December 12th. December 12th. December 12th. And if, if that interests you, please go out to mobilize.us um, forward slash OK Democrats where we have um, statewide phone banking. So you don't have to be in Lawton, no matter where you are. You don't even have to be in Oklahoma. No matter where you are, you can dial in and call voters in Lawton and make sure that they're aware of a special election because a lot of times people don't vote because they don't even know what's happening. Make sure they're aware, but make sure that they know about Larry. Yeah, Larry Bush, that's a great point. And Johnny Jernigan was uh, his opponent too. And uh, shout out to him, too, for giving people in Lawton a choice between two great Democratic candidates who kept the campaigns clean and focused on the issues. They are a shining example for what we can do when we are fighting for the issues and we're showing voters that there are alternatives to what you've been given for years and years. And it's also a testament to you, Alicia, and the state Democratic Party for building up a organization that is now getting people not only involved with campaigns, but putting their name on the ballot, which requires so much courage. So thank you to Johnny and Larry for both running and to all the candidates out there. Thank you so much for running. It's thankless and at points it can feel like uh, no one has your back. And it's, it may feel that way, but that's not that's not the case. It's Funds are very limited, but I promise you, if you put in the work day in and day out and you knock those doors and you start getting those IDs back and you're showing that you're putting in the work, then the support will come. But I was in the same position running against a Republican incumbent in 2016. I thought when I signed my name, and there was also different party leadership back then, but I remember when I put my name on that ballot, 
I thought, oh, I'm going to get all the hoorah and all the accolades and pat on the backs. But no, it was like, uh, yeah, go work, go knock those doors. And no one cared. And so that's what I did. I went and knocked doors and I would talk and ask people what's important to them. And after three or four months of that day in and day out, eventually I started to turn some heads. And then that's when support started to come in. And even if the support doesn't come in as much as you'd like, uh, rely on those family and friends that believe in you and your message and show your hard work on the Internet. Show constituents that you're fighting for them, that you're showing up and that you're listening. And, uh, and more often than not, it will it will work out positively for you. Listen to him. That's what he did. He, he did it against what seemed like it wasn't going to work. But now we have Representative Mickey Dollins, who not only fights for us during session, but he takes up his time here on a Thursday, every Thursday to give us updates. And we are grateful for you for that. Grateful to you for that. And shout out to Shakira Smith, who just posted in here too in Comanche County. Uh, she's running a great campaign down there as well. It's a perfect example of the type of candidate you want to be like. And uh, anyone who's interested in, in going down there and knocking doors with her, I highly recommend it. Thank you for that. All right, you guys, thanks for joining us. And I will be back here tomorrow at 415. All right. Thank you all. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.